Mrs. Beam tells us we are going to play some games called icebreakers. I can already tell that school in America is going to be easy for me. At Vidya Mandir, we never played games during class. On my first day of fourth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Aaron, gave us a test. The first game Mrs. Beam teaches us is called fruit salad. I am on the team called bananas, and Dylan is on the apples. Another game is called wink murder. In this game, one person is the murderer, and he or she has to knock people out by winking at them. I find this game a bit confusing, because even when Dylan is not the one chosen to be the murderer, he still winks at me. The last game we play is called Ven Friends. For this game, Mrs. Beam assigns us partners. I hope that she will put me with Dylan Samreen, but instead my partner is a pale, skinny girl called Emily Mooney. You'll have a few minutes to interview each other, Mrs. Beam explains. Find out as much as you can about your partner. For instance, what kind of music does he or she like? What are his or her favorite food or sport? When you finish your interviews, you'll create a Venn diagram showing all the things you have in common. What the heck, says a red-haired boy with freckles. He doesn't know what a Venn diagram is, so Mrs. Beam has to explain it. At Vidya Mandir, we learned how to make Venn diagrams in third grade. Each of you must draw a circle and fill it with lists of things that your partner enjoys, Mrs. Beam says. Then you and your partner will draw two overlapping circles. Where the circles intersect, you'll make a list of all the things you've discovered you have in common. At first, I think this will be an easy game for me. But every time I try to ask Emily Mooney a question, she giggles and says, What? Then when I try to answer her question, she does the same thing. Appa says that someday I will be interested in girls, but that day has definitely not come yet. When Mrs. Beam calls time, the only thing Emily Mooney and I have found to place in the intersection of our diagram is that we are both in room 506, and that was my idea. I am glad when Mrs. Beam tells us it's time to get ready for lunch. At Vidya Mandir, our lunch period began at 1 o'clock. Fifth graders at Albert Einstein Elementary School eat lunch at 11.30 in the morning. When I get to the lunchroom, the first thing I do is look for Dylan Samreen. In India, my best friend Pramud and I always ate lunch together. Afterwards, we'd play cricket in the field behind the school. I spot Dylan standing in the queue waiting to buy his lunch. They are serving something I have never heard of before called chicken fingers. Most of the tables are filling up quickly but I spot an empty table on the opposite side of the lunchroom and sit down. While I wait for Dylan to join me, I carefully lay out the cloth napkin that my mother packed for me, neatly folded with a spoon tucked inside. I'm not feeling very hungry, but Amma will be upset if I don't eat the lunch she made me. A puma made with pure desi ghee, she said as she stirred the pot this morning. Semolina will give you plenty of energy for your first day of school, Ravi. Too lumpy, Perima criticized, looking over my mother's shoulder as she cooked. I am just getting ready to open my stainless steel tiffin box when Dillam Samreen walks by carrying his tray. I caught a glimpse of his underwear earlier in class. There are red dots on it. I think about my own underwear, clean white Hanes from Kohl's, that my mother insists on ironing. There is no way I would ever let my underwear hang out like that whatever that kind of underwear is called. I thought Dylan and I would eat lunch together today, but instead he goes and sits down at a table in the corner by the window with some of the other boys. I had been looking forward to having a good laugh with him about Mrs. Beam, suggesting that I need special help, but it's okay. I'm not worried. I'm sure that Dylan and I are going to be friends. He's been smiling and winking at me all morning. A big white kid with yellow hair and a wrinkled shirt comes and puts his tray down at the other end of my table. He doesn't say hello to me, just sits down on the bench. He's so big the table shakes and my tiffin box jumps. I recognize him as the guy who sits behind me in class, but I don't remember his name. He doesn't seem very friendly. He picks up his fork and starts shoving food into his mouth and doesn't stop eating until his plate is clean. I think maybe he forgot to eat breakfast. And what's that he's got in his ears? I'm feeling a little hungry now, too. I spread the napkin on my lap and bend down, sniffing at the upuma. Parima was wrong. 
It's perfect, not lumpy at all. So I gobble it down quickly. I need to wash my hands and rinse my mouth. But for some reason, there isn't any sink in the lunchroom. I look at my watch. I still have ten minutes left until the bell rings. So I tuck the spoon back into the napkin, place it in my tiffin box, and buckle the lid. As I'm on my way out of the lunchroom to wash up in the boys' bathroom, a roar of laughter comes from the table in the corner by the window. Dylan Samreen must have made a good joke because everyone is slapping him on the back and treating him like he's a hero. I smile to myself. I know exactly how it feels to be that guy. I know something else, too. Tomorrow, I will not be eating my lunch alone. I will be sitting at the table in the corner by the window right next to Dylan Samreen. Chapter 4, Joe. It's Monday, so the cafeteria is serving chicken fingers with canned peas and apple slices. I had a big breakfast, and it's only 1130 but I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, for real. I go through the line as fast as I can. Ethan and Evan and I used to eat at the round table near the milk machine, but things are different now. I have to lie low. After I pay for my food, I carry my tray over to the other side of the cafeteria, keeping my head down the whole time. So far, so good. There's a long table against the back wall. Nobody ever sits there because it's near the trash cans. Fifth grade has the first lunch period, though, so I figure the smell won't be too bad yet. I sit down, put in my earplugs, and inhale everything on my plate in about three seconds. I'm still hungry, but I don't want to take any chances by going back for more. As I'm sucking down some of the last of my chocolate milk, I notice someone sitting all the way down at the other end of the table. It's that shrimpy new kid from my class the one with the big glasses and the long name who sits in front of me. He's got this weird-looking lunchbox open in front of him, and he's eating something that looks like scrambled eggs. Robert Prinsenthal walks by and accidentally bumps my shoulder. At least I think it's an accident. Robert is another Dylan Samreen wannabe. The difference between him and Tom Dinkins is that Robert isn't mean when he's on his own. Sorry about that, putty tat, he says, and keeps going. My name is Joe Sylvester, but thanks to Dylan Samreen, I am known at school as Putty Tat. It's on account of that thing that Twitty Berg always says to Sylvester the Cat in the old Looney Tunes cartoons. You know, I taught I taught a Putty Tat. I wish people would call me Joe, but when Dylan Samreen decides he's going to call you something, whether you like it or not, that's what everyone else is going to call you too. So at school, I am Putty Tat, Putty or Pud for short. Giving a person a nickname is a way of saying you like them, my mother said when she found out about it. Trust me, I told her. Dylan Samreen doesn't like me. What's not to like, she'd asked, kissing the top of my head. She always does stuff like that, which is why we had to have the big talk this morning. Pretend you don't even know me, I told her, and promise you won't do any of your corny mom stuff. I promise, she said, then made an X over her heart with her finger. We'll see, I thought. The new kid is busy eating his lunch, and I'm done with mine. So I just sit there for a while watching Dylan Samreen. I do that a lot, not because I want to, but because I have to. One time in second grade, when I put my jacket down on a bench out on the playground, Dylan filled the pockets with dirt. Another time, he slipped one of those little packets of ketchup in my homework folder and pounded on it with his fist to make it pop. He's always grabbing the back of my shirt or trying to punch or trip me when nobody's looking. His favorite thing of all is to sneak up behind me and make a loud noise because he knows how much that freaks me out. It wasn't until last year that I realized Dylan was a klepto. His parents are loaded, so he doesn't need the stuff he steals. He just does it for fun. He'll take anything he can get his hands on, a pencil sharpener, a glove, a retainer case. It doesn't matter. Wherever he is, he shoves it down the front of his pants for safekeeping. Since I never take my eyes off him, I've seen him do it a million times. But I don't ever tell on him, because what good would it do? He'd just fast talk his way out of it and find a way to pay me back double. 
After my mom found the dirt in my pocket, she suspected something might be going on. Is that Sam Rain boy bothering you, she asked. No, Mom, I lied. We can talk to Miss Frost about it, she suggested. No, I shouted. Everything's fine. I worry about you, Joey. You never have anyone over to the house. I have lots of friends at school, I told her. Like who? Ethan and Evan? The Burdock twins, she'd asked. Those boys are so wild. She doesn't know the half of it. Ethan once stole his father's car keys and drove around the neighborhood in his pajamas. And even though Evan never got caught, I know for a fact that he was the bathroom bandit of Einstein, notorious for drawing dirty pictures on the bathroom walls and throwing wet toilet paper balls on the ceiling. Dylan and his buddies are busy yucking it up, so I figure it's a good time for me to go empty my tray. I guess the new kid must have left when I wasn't looking because he and his funny looking lunchbox are gone now. I pick up my tray and make it as far as the trash cans before my luck runs out. Hey, Pud, Dylan comes over to me and puts his arm around my shoulders. How's it going? My heart starts pounding and I feel myself go wet under the arms. Dylan Samreen is like one of those crocodiles you see on the Discovery Channel, lurking underwater with just his eyes showing waiting to grab anything dumb enough to come within his reach. I'm good, I say, trying to duck out from under his arm. He tightens his grip on my left shoulder and with the other hand pulls the earplug out of my right ear, drops it on the floor, and crushes it with his shoe like a bug. In, two, three, out, two, three. Listen, Pud, before you go, can I ask you something, he says. I guess so. I look down at my shoes. It feels weird having only one ear plug in, lopsided. Is it my imagination, or does that new lunch monitor look familiar? Dylan puts his mouth so close to my ear it makes me squirm. I don't say anything. Just keep my eyes glued to the, my shoes and breathe. In, two, three, out, two, three. I notice one of my shoelaces has come untied. Take a look, putty, says Dylan, jerking his head back to shake the hair out of his eyes. Tell me if you recognize her, too. I don't move. Oh, was that question too hard for you, Pud? You need me to talk a little slower? Take a look. I don't want to look, but what choice do I have? I lift my head. My mom is standing over near the milk machine. She's wearing a red and white striped apron, and she has a whistle around her neck. When she sees me looking at her, she smiles and blows me a kiss. I honestly think I might be having a heart attack. This is exactly what I was afraid would happen. It's the whole reason we'd had the big talk. My face feels like it's on fire. Come on, Pud, says Dylan. You don't want to hurt her feelings, do you? Blow her a kiss back. What's going on, Dill, asked Tom Dinkins. He and Robert and this weird kid, Jax, have come over to empty their trays. Pud is about to blow a kiss to his mommy, the lunch monitor, and then she's going to change his poopy diapers. Tom laughs. What the heck, says Jax. No kidding. Putty, is that really your mom, asks Robert. The bell rings, making me jump. Suddenly, everybody starts rushing around, cleaning up, and getting ready to go back to class. Dylan grins and winks at me, then lets go of my shoulder and walks away. He's done with me for now, but I'm not stupid enough to think it's over. My knees are shaking, but I manage to dump my tray and get out of there as fast as I can. The rest of the afternoon is a total waste of time. Mrs. Beam calls on me twice, even though my hand isn't up. It's only the first day of school, and fifth grade already sucks.